Hey there, and welcome to the Pseudo Show, brought to you by the Destination Linux Network. Today, we meet with Jasmine Tsai, the head of engineering for Mutz Inc. We discuss remote work, growing your team, and being successful in a virtual workforce. All that and more on this episode of the Pseudo Show. Welcome to the Pseudo Show, your home for all things enterprise open source. I'm Eric, the IT guy, and joining me every episode is my co-host, the quiet genius, Brandon Johnson. How are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing great, and it sounds like someone's been doing Tilt. Yes, right you are. We just, uh, we just took a Tilt for Teams class at work, and to no one's surprise, I came back as an impact. So for those of you uh, personality nerds out there, Clifton Strengths, I'm an activator, Tilt. I'm an impact, and I probably won't get around to this, but it kind of makes me want to go out and take some of the other tests, but I'm, I, I feel like it'll, it'll come back pretty much the same. I'm full of energy, it drives Brandon crazy, and that is my job on this show. <laughs> it's a good thing we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, let's, uh, let's bring our guest in, shall we? Yep. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean recently announced their new Managed MongoDB service, which is a fully managed database as a service. With Managed MongoDB, you can focus more on building scalable, high-performance apps and less on maintaining the database. DigitalOcean built this service in partnership with MongoDB Inc., and together they've ensured that you will get access to all the latest releases of the Mongo database as they become available. As a listener of the Pseudo Show podcast and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free. Actually, better than free, because DigitalOcean is giving you a $100 credit when you go to do.co slash DLN Mongo. Need more than just a database? You can use your $100 credit to try out all the amazing services DigitalOcean has to offer. Again, go to do.co slash DLN Mongo to get started with your $100 free credit on DigitalOcean's new managed MongoDB. And thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Pseudo Show and the entire Destination Linux network. Today's interview is sponsored by none other than Bitwarden. Bitwarden is the easiest and safest way for individuals, teams, and businesses to store, share, and sync sensitive data. You can go to bitwarden.com slash DLN to check out their amazing service. With security breaches a regular occurrence now, experts suggest using a unique password for every account. That could easily be over 200 passwords. How do you remember all those? That's where a password manager comes in, and the password manager trusted by the Destination Linux Network is Bitwarden. You can get started on Bitwarden for free or unlock a suite of additional tools for just $10 per year. That's right, per year. That $10 will give you all the free features, one gig of encrypted file storage, vault health reports, two-factor code generation, and priority customer support. If you want to make the smart move, get a password manager and make that manager Bitwarden. Go to bitwarden.com slash DLN. And thank you, Bitwarden, for supporting the pseudo show in the entire Destination Linux network. Ever since we launched the pseudo show, we'd all hoped for kind of a return to normal. But with everything happening in, in the world, with travel concerns, with new variants popping up, that may just never happen. There, I, I said it. it. We've all been feeling it. It just, we may never go back to a pre-2020 normal. And it's up to us, especially as technologists, to kind of pave the way and be there to try blazing new trails, setting a new normal. And that, that may very well be a virtual normal. So finding the right tools, the right workflows are absolutely critical to remaining productive. Joining us today is Jasmine Sai of Mux. She has not only managed to keep her team productive over the course of the past year, but has even doubled it in size. So Jasmine, welcome very much to the Pseudo Show. Hi, happy to be here. So Jasmine, I want to just dive right in, like into the topic. But let, let's, you know, get to know you a bit. How how did you get involved in technology and and uh, come to work for Mux? My story there is probably a little bit convoluted and long, and I I don't know how much of it you really want to hear. <laughs> but I have one of those what people would call non traditional quote unquote backgrounds. So I did not, you know, study computer science or engineering in college. I was very much a arts major. I thought I wanted to 
go work for the World Bank someday. So it was international relations and economics and finance for me. Um, some of that was also like driven by, I grew up in Asia. I thought I wanted to go back to Asia and what jobs were available there. But anyway, long story short is I went into it, found that I absolutely hated it <laughs> in that it's a lot of like writing essays and papers and PowerPoints. I came upon technology when I was exploring what I wanted to do um, after my first job. And I wanted to start a nonprofit organization. And I think similar to a lot of people's stories, like started dabbling on how, how we will have like an online presence there and um, how to get things up and running. And then kind of explore that as a career path, I taught myself computer science and coding. And then my first engineering job was at change.org. So it was still kind of aligned with where I wanted to go in terms of development. And then second job was at Clover Health, which was healthcare, also social impact. So now at Mux, the video space is definitely a complete pivot. And that's a whole story of its own kind of realizing what, you know, what kind of companies you want to work for and how challenging it is to work in companies where software is not the product. But really happy to be at Mux now. Like the video space is super, super interesting, both technologically and the product space right now. And the team is great. I really look for like people that I can trust at any jobs. And that's, yeah, it's been great. So if it makes you feel any better, the whole I went to school for computers and now I work in computers thing isn't as common as you might think. That is my background. I went to school to be in technology and I work in technology. Ironically, I've moved out of an operations focus into marketing nowadays. So it's it's actually kind of rare to find somebody who goes to school and and does what they went to school to do. So good on you for for kind of trying things out and then pivoting to find something that that you really enjoy. There's definitely more and more of us. There's still a lot of people that go to school for um, for computer science and engineering, though. Like I interview a ton of them, so so I know that for a fact. But the ironic thing is, actually, both my parents were CS and electrical engineering majors, and somehow there was a gap that happened. And yeah, they never talked about technology at home, so I it's it's a disconnect. I I still can't quite figure it out. You started out with change.org and then you moved into healthcare. So you mentioned that it's a, another interesting story on how you came to be at Mux. As we start talking about Mux in the video space, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you how you went from healthcare to the video space? Yeah, that's definitely a big pivot and change in terms of not not being adjacent in industry, but I think after healthcare, it was Clover Health. I kind of realized that the incentives of building software in a company are really different when you don't sell, sell software as a product, right? Mm -hmm. So definitely, there's a couple of things that happen is like you have a lot of economics pressure on the build versus buy. And sometimes, a lot of times, buying is the right answer. But sometimes just jumping to that conclusion is not the right thing to do. But that that pressure is hard to overcome when you don't sell the software as a product. And then the second thing I think is like, what kind of seat at the table does engineering actually have um, in terms of decision making when you are in a company where, you know, the software is in service of something else? Um, it's really, it's much harder to be part of the strategy conversations. I think it kind of, you're sitting more downstream of those decisions. So yeah, I really wanted to make sure that I was in a space where it is more like a SaaS product, where you need to have the te technical differentiators to actually stay compelling as a product and to, to keep investing in it. And then I think I probably pivoted too far, <laughs> just went, went all the way into video. There's probably a few hops in between <laughs> that also have that those characteristics. But I stumbled upon Mux by chance and... Just like the moment when I was on the on the site, I just you know that the product really resonated with me, and the the things that kind of happened in the world after that is by coincidence. But now it's like a super 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 interesting space to be in. So 
what are the key products that make up the Mux portfolio? Uh, video is probably you brought it up, but is there any anything else behind it that helps uh, you monetize this uh, space? Yeah. So right now, Mux has two big products: Mux Data and Mux Video. Very descriptive names. Mux Data is the first product that the the company actually started with. It's an observability tool for video analytics, and it's basically collecting data that's being emitted by the players and operating system um, at the on, on the client side, on the device level, and then sending that to our back end for kind of computation analysis. And that helps basically video and other engineering teams to understand how their streams are actually performing at scale. So that product has a lot of customers are, are not just, um, you know, um, small engineering teams, but also like large media broadcasters. So folks like Fox, CBS use that product to monitor large events at scale. And then Mux Video is our end-to-end API-based solution for ingesting and delivering and manipulating both video-on-demand content as well as live streams. And so it's using like similar API abstraction for both, but you know the actual profile of the content is is very different for video on demand versus live streams. And then I think that the end goal vision is to you know be the name that you think of when you're a developer working with video. So anything that kind of different tooling, different parts of tooling in the ecosystem. So we're also looking at other large initiatives that are more in the the alpha stage right now. Um, the rest of video video ecosystem. So I, I think we could all figure out how a, an entity like Fox might use your platform. You mentioned event space. So how would someone use your products to put on, say, a virtual conference? Yeah, so we actually have a ton of customers that are in the live events space. So they're typically doing a blend of you know WebRTC video using one of the WebRTC video providers. And then broadcasting that out with uh, one of the Mux video APIs on um, basically RTMP stream based live streaming. You know, that allows like these um, platforms to have two modalities where there's a conversation happening with a smaller group of people that's using, you know, where some sort of web RTC platform. And then that's broadcasted out to a larger audience who is still participating maybe not as near real time. And with WebRTC video, you have cost challenges and reliability challenges when you have a large group of participants. So that's kind of the way where you can have both interactivity, but then also broadcast it out to to a larger audience. So behind a lot of this, I'm imagining you're not reinventing the wheel, probably contributing and definitely using open source software like what would you say is like the main project that you're contributing to or utilizing to make all this function or multiple? Doesn't need to be just one. There's definitely a lot of different things. When I think about open source in the context of Mux, there's probably three big, big buckets I would think of. One is like the client side technology. So all the players, one, like the founders from Mux were the original creators and major contributors of VideoJS, which is one of the biggest HTML5-based player for the web. And it was started at the time when, you know, these new web te- technologies were coming out. It was one of the first HTML5 players and that was open source. So we still stay pretty actively involved in the community for different open source players, not just VideoJS, but also looking at things like HOSJS right now. And then there's kind of the second bucket would be core technologies in media space. So that's like FFmpeg, definitely. Oh, yeah. Many, many people rely on this, right? And uh, including us. And we, you know, will submit upstream changes when, when we need to and are also looking into more sponsorship opportunities there. And then the third large bucket the show actually uses FFmpeg to uh, deploy to the different platforms that we publish on. Yeah, I think all video, all forms of video are, are touching FFmpeg somewhere. 
in their chain. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> yeah, the internet is, is built on top of it. <laughs> the third big bucket is um, sort of open source distributed systems technologies. So that's around technologies that help us scale the ingest and delivery of video. So that would be things like Flink, Apache Flink, Apache Kafka, a lot of the enterprise model software that have an open source version as well as um, their enterprise support version, like Cockroach as well. And the list is pretty long there, actually. I imagine so, yeah. I kind of want to pivot a little bit to building a team during a pandemic. I mean, I just recently became get, got into people leadership. I've been in technology leadership for a while, but... There's like a phrase for that when you go into entry management. It's congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Pivoting into this during the pandemic has been interesting because I manage a team not just in, in the United States, but I also have a team in, uh, part of my team in Canada, even though some people in the U.S. like to think that Canada is part of the U.S., but it, you know, maybe they think I'm, I, I'm running a domestic <laughs> team. No, I run an international team. <laughs> but obviously, this is going to be very distributed. Like, How are you managing your employees' work? What's been like the best way that you have seen in, during this time of managing uh, remote work? Yeah. That's a really big topic. So, you know, I'll try to distill down some thoughts and feel free to, to ask more questions around, uh, around anything. I think one big thing that is maybe unexpected is I actually benefit a lot, I think, from just the overall support of the company foundations. So there is a lot that goes into running the execution well for, for a single team. But if your company is investing a lot in like its people department and the people operations side of things, it actually makes like your job so much easier already right off the bat. So our people ops team manages a lot of the onboarding process. We specify who people need to meet when they come on board and maybe we find a buddy for them and then you know review the materials of things that they need to go through but we have a company onboarding process as well as the team level onboarding process that covers a lot of the basics around culture around how to work within the context of mux on slack that just takes a lot of that overhead away from the individual managers which is great because i think when you if you're in a company where that's not as much invested, you have to do all of that yourself. Like you basically have to start from scratch and you have to explain like, here are the company values. Here is how we work. And those take a lot of time and effort. So that, that would be one of the things that I think, I, I know that it's not always possible in the context of every company, but I certainly do think it's one of the big, biggest things that helped us at, at Mux is there's a unified onboarding that's run by the people operations team on, on the basics that's common across all the t different teams. And then within engineering, we follow a lot of the same principles, right? We have, we, we made a really big push for documentation when we all went remote. We kind of push for writing things down in terms of the decision-making process. We follow a guided process for technical design and continue to iterate on how we do that so that not everybody's calendars look like just a block of bricks. <laughs> so, you actually, <laughs> so you actually are taking the time to write it, to asynchronously review it, and then only meet to resolve like the biggest questions instead of relying on meetings to you know, cover content that you, you can already cover async. Basically, if I'm hearing, like, just try to keeping meetings to a minimum by like asking questions about documentation in Slack, maybe just resolve big things in like a weekly stand up. Is that what I'm kind of hearing here? Yeah, we have um, different levels of process, I, I guess. It also really helps that we have, you know, OKRs and then projects trickle down from OKRs. And then those things all run in a predefined way that people already understand. So you're not trying to 
run around and reinvent the wheel every time. But yeah, we encourage people to write things down in design documents and tickets. And then we run pretty standard like planning process on top of that. One of the questions I hear a lot from people that are are new to or are struggling with this remote work concept is how do you manage, it's strange that this is kind of the first question, but how do you manage people that, shall we say, are not performing well? Obviously, the question is usually, well, you're virtual, so you don't have a manager walking by your cubicle. So how do you how do you deal with the people that are like playing Halo during the workday? It's kind of the the point of their question. But how do you yeah. how do you monitor performance? How do you regulate kind of that work life balance? I think if you're getting to the level where you have to monitor someone whether they're playing Halo during the day, <laughs> then you're probably not managing for the right things. Like I am a strong believer in manage the outcomes, not the activities. Even if sometimes you do have to nudge activities a little bit and put guardrails up. So outcomes would be that's why like what i was saying around okrs and projects is actually really helpful because there's a clear like these are the goals for our quarter these are the projects that we're going to accomplish from those goals this is your part in the project here's how we run it did you do the things right did you actually uh, move the project forward and if they're doing all those things if they're playing halo for 20 minutes in in during the day in their break that's probably not the biggest like (laughs) deal to be honest they have to show the results and outcomes of the work that they're doing. And the second thing that I think helps around the outcomes part is like the career career framework for engineering within the team. So what are some of the expectations if you're senior in terms of how autonomous you are in guiding a project to completion? What are the expectations if you're at mid-level versus staff? How do you interact with your teams and be able to point clearly to those and say, hey, these are not the things I'm, I'm seeing you doing. Like those conversations are tend to be pretty, pretty easy if there is like a clear gap. I think it's when the expectations are not clear on what the results should be. That's, that's much harder. So experientially, over the past year, I think the opposite is, has probably become a problem. Not of people slacking off when they're working remote, but are, are working too much. What are you doing as a leader or Mux doing as a culture to prevent people from working too much? Yeah, this is a tough one. And that's true for most folks. Yeah. There's no leaving the office to go home. There's not that mental barrier. Yeah. I think reminding people to take vacation, that's a big one. I should probably spend some of my PTO. <laughs> <laughs> at some point forcing people to take vacation also works i definitely have a few people on my team that were near burnout and i was just like no you gotta you just have to take a vacation and then they come back and you know their their mindset is totally different and i have gone through that myself um, especially when i first became a manager you you just feel like, oh, I'm so underwater. I, I must work more when the opposite is usually true. Like you need to step away. You'll find that the world did not end when you step away. <laughs> and it's fine. So uh, forcing people to take vacation, um, including yourself. And the other thing I have really appreciated about Mux is nobody's really messaging after 6 p.m. Um, unless it's an incident. And that is not the same in my partner's company (laughs) where you know he's definitely getting a lot of slack messages throughout the night or emails that just pop up and i really appreciate that we we do not have that culture amongst it's really actually just messages off emails off so yeah what brought up that you know in the intro you were able to double the size of your team during during the quarantine obviously at the onboarding processes that really helps streamline it. Uh, but let's talk about what you look for when you're building the, how do, do you look for people who've worked remote before? Do, are, what are the traits you're, you look at, look for? Yeah, there's a set of things that Mux looks for. And I think what I look for personally is also pretty aligned with that. And I, I do think there are traits there that makes like remote work easier as well. The first thing is definitely a sense of ownership and the drive. So do you do the work because you want to do the work, either because you're really interested in the space and the problems, or or maybe just because you care about the quality of your work? 
or maybe because you want to learn something about a new space. Whatever your motivation is, is fine. But just like, do you have that innate sense of like, I want to do a good job. I want to actually like learn about this and dive into this just because I have that kind of innate curiosity and drive to do so rather than somebody asking you to do it. And and that makes, I think, a lot of the remote work also a little bit easier because you're trusting that people have that motivation and that sense of responsibility. And then I think another thing relevant to remote work is probably communication and, and collaboration. So people who want to communicate out what they're doing, have a curiosity of what the re- the rest of the team is doing, what are we building for the product, and also have that ability to to communicate their thought process well through it. I think those two things make make the remote setting a lot a lot easier. I asked this to my fellow man peers. Do you find that that like if you're doing your stand-ups or doing is are you getting more f- effective uh, results with when people are on video versus not? And a two-parter, are you noticing like a difference in maybe the quality of work between those who are engaged on video versus not? Great question. This is something that actually came up today <laughs> for me. Oh, I was just going to ask like, what what have you heard so far? <laughs> so I'll, I'll t- say my take. I'm like, I think it just depends. Like we're mostly in a, or on the sell side, but like you can tell who's uh, underwater on their number <laughs> versus the ones who are the top performer right now. Or if they've just like had, maybe they just have chaos going on. You don't really know. But like, I, I haven't really seen a difference yet personally. Like I'm on a team of, I think I work on the best team. I think everyone thinks that they're uh, on a great team. So I haven't seen a difference yet on the on the video side, like if you're on or off. Oh, do you mean like the turning on the video or off the video? Or uh, uh, yeah, if they stay on video, like they're on, oh, you're on a Zoom call it. and you stay on. Are you yeah. like what's have you seen that like a difference in the between top performers and ones doing okay? You know, they're they're off video. They don't. Like they're trying to just scoot by. I don't know how else to put it, but but I don't think, but I don't really see. I haven't seen a difference there. I just see if you've seen that or not. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it's. It's probably not predictive. Yeah, I think sometimes it's nice to have everybody's videos on just so you could, you know, see how people are reacting. Yeah, but I turn off my videos in meetings that where I'm not the primary driver as well. It's just, it's kind of, it can be really exhausting to see your face all day. Right. So that's true. Sometimes it's just good to see people, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you haven't seen them in a while. I mean, we've been in this now going on, you know, we're going to be hitting two years here before we know it. So of uh, not going to a conference, shaking hands and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. sitting around a table, sharing a meal with our colleagues. So yeah, it's, probably not a good indicator or not, but I just thought it's something I've been asking because it's like, it came up, actually it came up today and I'm just, I'm like, eh, I don't think it really matters, but maybe that's just me. I don't know that it's a performance indicator, but I think it's definitely a quality, a kind of a health factor of, of how well the team's doing. For instance, if we, we have a team call once a week for 90 minutes where we just go through everything it's it's almost a sprint planning meeting but it's not called that and we literally do go around the room and we we ask questions what are your blockers what do you need help with and it's not in that agile format but it's it's definitely taken its influences from that and we've experimented with all video off calls and then the default method is if you can try to be on video and the the meetings where the majority of folks that are interacting on the call are on video or like you alluded to Jasmine, or at least are on video for the portions that apply to them. I, I'm an individual contributor, so I don't I don't need to be involved in the budget conversation. So I'll I'll go off mute and I'll respond to an email real quick while some of the some of the folks that are pushing for budget are talking. But then when we come to a video project or something that I'm working on, then I'm back on video because I want my reactions to be visible. I want to be able to interact uh, two ways, even even through a webcam. 
Yeah, I, I think there are some really interesting experiments people are doing around different, you know, different tools, different collaboration medium, like just even the lit- smallest tweaks can make a big difference. Like, you know, I know like Clubhouse is not the hottest thing anymore, but I do think audio is coming back in a way that is makes a lot of sense also for, for collaboration, right? Like other than the whole podcasting space, like being able to maybe just have an audio channel on where people can talk through things without having the overhead of like looking at the video the whole time is really, really interesting. And I, I think there will be like more and more experiments that people people do. There's definitely been a lot of research that has gone into this whole virtual workspace and what's what's working, what's not. And in fact, I read an article just a few weeks ago about a study that was kind of an extension of this whole Zoom fatigue idea. And there is some scientific, probably anecdotal at this point, but there is some scientific evidence showing that it is more exhausting to see yourself talk. So like we use Zencaster for our podcast recordings. And we record with video on, even though we're an audio only podcast that allows the Brandon and myself and if we have a guest on to be able to see each other and and see who's kind of leaned into their microphone and is getting ready to share something. It's very beneficial to see each other even while recording an audio only podcast. But one of the things that's so frustrating about Zencaster versus uh, Zoom or Google Chat or uh, Google Meet, sorry, or I think pretty much all the major players have now added this feature in where you can turn off self view. So when I when I jump into a Google Meet meeting or when I jump into a Zoom call, I leave my video on for a few seconds. I make sure that I'm kind of centered into the frame, that I'm well lit, that hopefully I don't have any food in my teeth, and then I turn that self view off because I don't I don't want to see myself, but I do want to see everybody else and I do want to make sure that I can be seen. That way people can judge my reactions and and just kind of interact on a more personal level. Yeah. I think in the video space, people definitely talk a lot about how Zoom is just like V0 of how we might interact over over video, like these little little rectangle and square boxes that we have right now. Like that, that's the first iteration of how we might do this. There's like really interesting companies out there. Like I don't know if you've heard of Around or Gattertown. You know they're trying to do. WebRTC video, but in a different way. So you're not just a rectangular box that's lined up in a grid. You can have like your profile that's kind of floating through your desktop as a desktop top client. So it doesn't feel like, you know, you're just like stepping into a literal web conference every time you have to collaborate on anything. I don't have a name off the top of my head, but it is, as you were talking, I was thinking about an example I saw that's kind of in, in beta right now that you can kind of pick your spot at a virtual table. And so as you're talking to people, there's spatial audio going on. So if someone picks a seat to your left, you kind of hear them more on your left than on your right, just to kind of yeah. help generate this this idea of we're all sitting in a room together collaborating instead of being perpetually stuck in the Brady Bunch introduction. Yeah, there's um, definitely a lot of different projects going on that are all like that. Of course, that not to overlook a tech conference that was actually carried out over Animal Crossing uh, last year. Oh, no, I, didn't, I missed that. <laughs> I just didn't hear about that. I think it was one of the DevOps Days conferences. Uh-huh. I know Matt Stratton from Arrested DevOps was part of that initiative. I forget some of the other some of the other key speakers, but they literally built an island and all the speakers got some game tokens to go in and create like outfits for themselves if they didn't already. And they literally carried out a full-fledged conference with keynotes and and lightning talks and everything on Animal Crossing. That's pretty amazing. Definitely some interesting approaches to to breaking the monotony of of living in a rectangular box. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. The Fedora project, they did uh, something very similar for their conference. Also in Animal Crossing? It wasn't using Animal Crossing. It was (laughs) using some web, it was a web thing. So I thought it was, it looked like a retro game. I don't remember what it was called yeah. off the top oh, of my cool. head. Yeah, but it was pretty sweet. That's really cool. I had a professor in college who would literally hold his office hours in World of Warcraft. I thought he was nuts, but turns out he was just ahead of his time. <laughs> <laughs> just to wrap up the conversation on remote work, I mean, like before all this, like, did you always work remote or was this new for you? Like, did you have to adapt? 
No, this was new. Yeah, this was new for me. Well, towards the end of my last job, it was going into more of a hybrid situation. But full remote is definitely new. And yeah, I, the first few months were hard. I was like not really done full time remote management before. It was just staring into Zoom, doing one on ones back to back, and then you know you then learn to like manage both your energy and productivity over time. Besides, uh you know, doing a one-on-one with your, with your people and telling them to go take vacation. Is there (laughs) (laughs) anything else that you're doing to help keep them motivated, help keeping them engaged? Like whether that's like sending like a Uber Eats card or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. We actually do um, a lot of things like that. Basically we've talked a lot about things related to productivity, right? But there's another dimension, which I think is what you're alluding to that I think is also really important is belonging. Like how do you continue to cultivate a sense of belonging and relationship building, even though you are all staring into a little box? So we do do a lot of like little gifts. That's mostly company initiated. We have remote you know, lunch re- reimbursements and support. Periodically, we send like, nice gifts to people, whether that's for their anniversaries or birthdays, or maybe sometimes their children's birthdays. And and I think those are all really like nice little gestures. For onboarding, we, we ask everybody to do like an introduction video of themselves. And that's partly because we're a video company and we should (laughs) encourage everybody to experience both like creating a video, uh, but also using our product to then ingest and, and deliver it. But I actually have found that that's been a really nice way to feel like, you know, the person that's behind the Slack screen, um, we are at the size now where not everybody is going to get to work with each other directly. And I think a lot of times that's when mistrust can happen, especially in a rapid growth situation, because you don't really like your brain doesn't register that that person is also just like a person. You register them, them more as like, oh, there's this other new new person in the company. And they may or may not make my job easier or harder, but I think with the video and having everyone just introduce like, what are your hobbies and how, you know, can we tell, tell us your story of how you got here and ask a question to the rest of the team that they, they can then answer has been really helpful for feeling like there's a person on the other side of the screen. Jasmine. I'm sure some people are like listening now and going, how do I get a job? Is Mux currently hiring? Yeah, we're we're growing a lot. We're hiring for a lot of different roles, both within engineering as well as in pretty much all the other functions in the company too. Great. Awesome. And should we uh, should we be sending folks your way anywhere? Do you have a, a blog or social media you'd like to uh, to plug as well? Sure. We have a blog. It's basically blog.mux.com slash blog. And then also the jobs page has all of our roles open. Perfect. We'll include links to the blog, to the jobs page, and to uh, Mux's website in the show notes. Meantime, anywhere else you'd like to send folks, Jasmine? I think uh, those are the big things. We also, uh, we organize a conference every October called DMUX. That's primarily um, video engineering topics. But if you're a video nerd who, or you just want to learn more about video, it will be obviously virtual this year, but it's a really fun conference to attend. Two years ago, when it was still in person, we actually got somebody from Silicon Valley and uh, was a surprise guest as a comedian closing talk at the conference. It's a fun time. We'll throw links to the uh, conference into the show notes as well. Meantime, thank you very much, Jasmine. We really appreciate it. I know we've we've had this interview on the calendar for some time now, so definitely appreciate you carving out some time to, to sit down and chat with us. Yeah, well, thank you for having me. And uh, it was fun to chat. Thank you so much for joining us today, folks. As always, your feedback is welcome. Head on over to sudo.show slash discuss. If you'd like more of Brandon and I, you can find it over at sudo.show and on social media at sudoshowpodcast. 
You can catch more awesome content over at our network partners, destinationlinux.network. Brandon, anywhere else you'd like to send folks? You can follow me on Twitter at dbrandonjohnson or my website, open-tech.net. And you can head over to Red Hat TV to catch me live every other Wednesday on Red Hat Enterprise Linux Presents. You can follow me at ITGuyEric on social media or ITGuyEric.com. Remember, the Pseudo Show is your place for all things enterprise open source. Until next time. 